record on this computer because I'm not sure if I have enough space on Zoom. Um, I guess it's not one o'clock yet. How is everybody doing? Good. Good. Up here. <laughs> Well, it looks like we're going to have the press. <laughs> Did Nancy make it? Yes. Hi, Doug. Hey, Miranda. <laughs> um, I had a request for this to be recorded to, so someone could watch it later. Is that possible? Uh, I am recording it right now. Oh, I do see that it's recording. Relate that. Okay, thank you. One as quiet as the church before the sermon. Because <laughs> right, we're all asleep. <laughs> you want to wait a few more minutes for people to sign up? Um, good. I don't know. How many people were we expecting? Do we have any idea? No idea. Okay. Currently, we have 18, I think. Yes. So just, just for housekeeping purposes, if everyone who is not presenting or talking could please mute their microphone. Otherwise, if you make any noise in your office or whatever, you know, screens come up and it's distracting. So I, uh, I, I will uh, say at the outset here, uh, if you did not see the information, uh, Governor Polis and Ag Commissioner Greenberg have signed a letter to Sonny Perdue, uh, the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, requesting a disaster declaration uh, due to the uh, cold events that Horst is going to talk about here at the end of October. Um, so that has been sent off to the USDA 
And I think the local farm service people are gathering the information. Uh, I have not seen any update um, for that quite yet, but um, hopefully it won't get lost in the uh, uh, in the shuffle uh, and the change of administrations. So, um, local levels they have sent in their information. And their and their form as of Friday afternoon. They did. They did. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah, I've been working with them over the week. Um, you know, getting getting numbers right and stuff. Yeah. Okay, well, we're still having people join us here. We are going to record this um, for posterity. So don't say anything you don't want recorded. And as always, I would like to say a big thank you to Cassidy and Cave um, for their partnership and support of these um, frequent industry recordings and, and meetings. Um, you know, I think that's one of the great things that's that's come out of COVID. Um, one of the few great things, um, you know, is that we we've got greater level of industry participation and I think greater industry communication um, because of all of the chaos that's been happening. So uh, thanks to Cassidy, thanks to Miranda for all the information she has been relaying to people. Um, thank you to Horst for all of your work. And I guess um, if we are, uh, if we keep expanding, but um, if we want to kick it off, I, uh, Cassidy, Miranda, did you have any welcoming messages you wanted to relay? Uh, just a big thank you as well to Doug and the Wine Board and Kyle, and it's really exciting to see so many people here. I wish it was a different topic we were talking about. Um, and again, thank you to Horst and um, Miranda. Um, and the CAVE staff for helping put all of these together and just relay all this information. Um, I'll turn it over to Miranda and Horse and, and we'll just get going. Thank you. And I just want to let everyone know that there's a ton of work that went into what Horse will be presenting today. He may even have some updated numbers, but last I heard he and his team dissected over 22,000 buds at more than 51 sites and including more than 38 varieties in both the Grand Valley and Roger or Delta County. So I just wanted to put that out there in the beginning because I thought it was really impressive. And then I'll turn it over to you, Horst. Thank you, Miranda. So do I have the right to share my screen, Doug? Let's see. Looks like I do. Okay, go for it. Let's, let's go for it. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, and in full mode now, hopefully. Yes. Okay, so what I want to summarize is the October 2020 damage that we saw, but uh, I want to actually start with acknowledgement. And that is actually thanking all the growers who allowed us to actually come into the vineyards and do a little destructive sampling. I mean, we didn't take many spots, but you know, and Adam and Jordan have in fact sampled over 20,000. It might be 23,000 now, I have no idea. Sometimes you lose count. I'd like to thank Miranda for actually helping us with some of that evaluation as well. So my talk basically is structured. I want to look back at October 19. Then I want to look at October 2020 and then look at some of the similarities or differences that we saw between the two events, uh, go into more detail of what we're finding when we look at a lot of different vineyards across the Grand Valley and actually from one side in Delta County, and then end with the question of, you know, okay, so we got all this, what are we doing next? So in October 19, as we all remember, or maybe most of us remember, we did have a very bad 
very extreme frost event right at the end of October. It was an advection freeze, meaning it was windy. So it has no inversion, so the wind machines cannot be used. Um, at the time, I said we used this opportunity in quotes to actually look at all the different varieties that we grow in cultivar trials. We also looked at some of the effect that a rootstock might have on cold hardiness and looked at some difference that may or may not exist with um, clones of Carbony 4. These are all from replicated experiments. So to go back to the October 19 event, um, we hit on the 30th of October, these are from the National Weather Service from the conjunction office. We dropped as low as seven Fahrenheit and the 31st it dropped as low as six Fahrenheit. And the previous records for those days were 19 and six. So we didn't just you know, lower the record, we totally smashed it. And that can be seen on this next graph here, hopefully uh, when you look over to the left. So this graph shows the minimum recorded temperature for October going back to 1900 and all the way out yeah. To 2017. So way over on the right is the 17 event, uh, the 2019 event, sorry. The 1917 was the previous low. And if you take a look, can you guys see the cursor, my cursor? My little? Yes. Okay, yes. good. So if you look at it, there's only like five times, except this 1917 event, that the temperature is actually below 20 Fahrenheit in the Grand Valley. So, and now we have a record of six. So that, that's definitely a very, very extreme event. At the research center here, this, this is data from our um, Vineyard weather station, also known as Block 10 on the Edcon uh, Cave web, web, weather station website. We can see we dropped to 9.1. But you can see also see how rapid that drop occurred. So if you look across the valley, uh, across the region, across the state of Colorado, you know, we had a couple of sites, Canyon City and also Penrose, that dipped below zero. Um, Penrose actually quite badly to negative 8.5. And, you know, most numbers called test delta, you know, four or five or two degrees or three degrees, something like that. That was pretty much across all of, of the region. These are the lows that we saw in the October 19 event. What we knew from continuous or regular cold hardiness measurements that we take. So we, we take buds from the field, we freeze them, we put them in a, in a programmable freezer, we take them out at certain temperatures and we evaluate what damage, if any, occurs at whatever temperature. And what we knew from the event then, that the temperature we saw was actually getting pretty close to or even below what our previous freezing test has shown us was the LT10, LT50, and LT90. And so just to recap what that means, LT stands for lethal temperature. So that is the temperature at which we would expect, let's look at that 4.6, for example, here. If the temperature would have dropped to 4.6, we would expect to see 10% damage on this particular variety. The LT50 for this variety would be a 2.3. So if the temperature dropped to 2.3, you would expect to see 50% damage. And that's what these temperatures show. And everything highlighted here in yellow is actually above or very close to the temperature that we saw. So this table suggests with the temperature we had, we should be seeing damage on those varieties. What was interesting that at the end of October last year, several of our so-called cold hardy varieties, you know, the cold hardy hybrids, also had temperatures, at least LT10s, that were higher than the recorded temperature we saw. So again, we might expect to see some damage on those varieties. So I'm gonna show you quests like this, quite a few and slightly different variations, forms. So this shows the 2019 maximum minimum temperature from the 1st of October. The green um, circle and the open black circle are LT10. So they say the green is the Chardonnay it says, well, the Chardonnay at the time this event hit had an LT10 of about four degrees. Our temperature dropped to nine degrees, so there should be no damage. For Syrah, it said, well, the temperature is actually right in that circle. So we should be seeing about 10% damage. Okay, ask me a question if you don't understand what I'm saying, please interrupt. This is just the same information plotted a little bit differently. This shows the entire dormant season. 
and this grayed out zone below the temperature. So in red is a high temperature, black is a, it's a cold temperature. Again, pretty obvious, I think, where our extreme event occurred right here. This is for Chardonnay and the, and the grayed out zone basically represents the area from 10 to 90% damage. So the upper edge of that gray out zone is the 10% temperature limit. The lower bottom, the lower margin is the 90. And the solid line that runs right through, pretty much through the middle, most of the time anyway, is the 50% lethal temperature. And as you can see for Chardonnay, uh, the temperature never got to the gray zone, so we shouldn't be seeing damage. Syrah looks a little different. Usually the line penetrates into the gray zone, but it's still a long distance away from the 50%. So somewhere between more than 10, but certainly less than 50% damage is what you might expect after an event like this, based on the method that we use to determine the butt cold hardiness. If you look at Cabernet Sauvignon, then it looks a lot worse because that temperature line, that nine degrees or seven, whatever it was, is right smack on the 50% line, which would suggest after this event, we should be finding 50% butt damage on Cabernet Sauvignon. And we can do these graphs for many different varieties and, and play with them. So what we did immediately after the event in October, we went out in early November and collected canes. And just a heads up, we did the same procedure this time again. We collected 20 canes per variety or rootstock or clove, whatever we were looking at. We evaluated the five basal buds. So for every variety, every location, every clone, every rootstock, we have a hundred buds that we evaluate. And then we cut these open and look for life, death, what type of damage do we have? Um, we also have, you know, the, the previous graph I showed you, these ones, these are weekly observations. So we have a lot more data points. So for some of those varieties, we use all the data points we have for the whole entire dormant season to determine what the, devil, the damage level actually was. This is from our site here at the research center and, and it shows all the varieties we do grow in, in cultivar trials. And it has a very far, wide range, so I'm gonna break it down a little bit. So what we saw in late October last year was really good bud survival. This, this is simply looking at the primary bud of Cabernet Dorsa and Marquette, 100% life, so no damage. Again, if you if we were to flick back to the table of the butt hardiness, you know, they were below where we would expect to see damage. So they, you know, Marquette, um, Cabernet Dorsa was four, four degrees, we got to nine, so we shouldn't be seeing any damage, and, it, and indeed we don't. So this ranges from 90 to 100% damage for the varieties listed here. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail, we had some that had significant damage. Not a damage that we may not be able to overcome with some adjusted pruning, but still significant damage. Going here from about 75% from a low to about 55% from a wet run. And then we had a whole bunch of varieties that had quite a lot of damage. We're talking 50 plus percent primary butt kill. And in the worst case, in the case of Barbera, we were down to 24% live primary buds. So that is significant damage and a damage that you're probably not gonna overcome by pruning adjustment. So you look at that data and what we're seeing with very few exceptions, everything that got hit really badly was late ripening varieties. Which suggested one or two things or maybe both. <clears throat> at least late variety, these late ripening varieties are actually also late acclimating. And I think that's a fact. We know that Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, is a late acclimating variety. It also could suggest that the early killing frost we had on the 11th of October, remember in 19, we had a very early killing freeze. Uh, much of the fruit was harvested after frost. So that, that had an effect on cold hardiness and actually reduced the cold hardiness. And I think the Sorry. fact is that we, yes? Can I interrupt real quick? We do have one oh. question in the chat about oh. that freeze on October 10th and 11th. And the question was, did these earlier freezes cause any damage? In 19, they did not. Uh, we did have a killing frost, um, but it didn't do any butt damage. Um, 
in fact, we'll show you in a little bit here that we actually had exceptionally good cold hardiness last year, but we had an even more exceptionally cold um, cold event in late October that caused the damage. So potentially there could have been a loss of cold hardiness uh, by the late harvest and the early freeze. <clears throat> but the event itself did no damage. Thank you. So looking very quickly here over some rootstock data, this is from a replicated v, uh, study with Vionnier. And what we found is that the ornamented vines, uh, this bar over here, actually had more but cold injury than vines where, where the Vionnier was grafted to a rootstock. And the best performing ones were 1103 pods and 5C, 5PV, but you know, plus minus 10% is probably something that we can find in any sample at any time of the day. So I wouldn't put too much value on it. But the trend is unrooted, more damage than rootstock. Um, this is from a three-year-old rootstock trial um, from a site about a mile and a half here from us. And what we saw there that, again, we're seeing a bit of a rootstock effect. We don't have unrooted in this, in this site, but there seems to be a little bit of, of difference. Um, again, 5C is up here, Schwarzbahn comes out. Overall, at that site, Cabernet Sauvignon did significantly better than at our site. We were below 50% in primary bud. These ones are all 70, roughly 70 to 90 some percent live. So that site did much better than ours. And as I mentioned earlier, what was surprising when we looked at the cold hardiness thresholds that we found in our freezing tests, there was a suggestion that some of the cold hardy ones might have even have been affected by this cold event. And that can be seen here. So if you look on the very far right, we have Cayuga, Chamberson, and Treminet, and they're all below 80% live primaries. So there was damage even on these so-called cold hardy varieties. Whereas on the other end, Aromella, Brianna, Marquette, 100% survival. Again, Marquette had 100% survival at our side as well. So it was sort of surprising to see that high damage. At Vinco, uh, earlier this year, I asked this, I said, you know, are these, this event we had in October, is it just a once in a lifetime, once in a 120 year event? Little did I know that I would be talking about it again this year. Uh, but I did show some data that suggested, and I won't go into, back into that. I did show some, some data that suggests that the frequency of extreme events in October, November, and December is much, much higher than statistically expected. We're getting two or three times the number of events in the last 20 years than we should have. In fact, the last, uh, this event adds even more, um, you know, argument to that, that uh, support to that argument. We're seeing more, more damaging events uh, than we should be seeing. So along came our this year's event, which happened, you know, four or five days earlier <laughs> than the previous one. And we again evaluated all, of, all the cultivars that we're looking at. We again looked at the Vionier Woodstock trial, looked at the Cabernet Sauvignon Woodstock trial, and we also went out and conducted a survey. So, you know, same procedures last year, right. Um, same number of buds evaluated. This time we dropped to 14 and nine. This is here from the research center and our previous records were 23 and 24. So again, this is basically only the third time that we actually see below 10 temperature uh, for us here at the site in October. Yeah. Again, similar graph in red, the high temperature in, in blue, the cold temperature, and you can see the minimum temperature for the day. And, and the dotted line will appear a few times in my graphs now. And that represents, the dotted line represents the lowest ever recorded temperature that we have for our sites for every single day. And in there, you can see already from last year, right next to the one that shows this year's low temperature, that's last year's event. Uh, without it, the line would have been running at 22, 23 degrees Fahrenheit. But you can see how far out of character that event is as well, compared to the previous lowest ever recorded temperature for the day. You already saw this from last year, except last year the line stopped way beyond, way above where the Chardonnay cold hardiness was. This time what we can see that it went right through even to the 50 line and even hit close to the 90 line. So we should expect very significant damage on Chardonnay and, and we do in fact have very significant damage on Chardonnay. 
you have already seen this graph, except a little different. Um, it was 90 degrees turned and it was all in red. And what I was showing you then in the previous slide was only the primary bud. In this case here now I'm showing you live buds. So the um, 10 type of color is the primary bud. And again, this is from 2019 and we had 100% survival on Marquette and Cabernet Dorsa. So you don't see anything about secondaries. So in the green color is actually the secondary bud. So you can see on Zweigeld where we had like 98% live primaries, there's also a couple of live secondaries. Same is true on Chamberson. So this whole bar is now, graph is now ordered by live buds. And you can see that some of them have fairly high survival of secondary, some have very little survival of secondary, but the overall picture hasn't really changed. We got a certain number of varieties that have done well, and we have a certain number of varieties that have done not so well, and you know, there may be a little switch here and there, but that's the general trend. So this graph now shows what we saw this year. And it's a lot more lively or a lot more disorganized maybe, uh, but I'm looking at the same variety across for both. So let's, let's look at the big picture here. Our first top four varieties from last year are still the top four varieties this year. When it comes to primary bud survival, not maybe to overall survival, but certainly for primary bud survival. The ones that were at the bottom last year are still at the bottom last year in terms of low survival. But there are also some differences. So let's just look at, for example, if I can get my cursor moving again here. Let's look at Carmenera. Carmenera last year had 90% live primary buds plus a small percentage of live uh, secondary buds. And it's got really, really badly damaged this year. If you look over here at Tinta Cavalia, which this year we couldn't even find a live tertiary. It was 100% killed. It wasn't doing outstandingly good last year, but it wasn't certainly wasn't the worst. If you look over here at Malvasia Bianca or over here at Malo, again, they had decent to good live primaries in the 19 event, and they have very few or none live primaries in the 30 event, in the 2020 event, sorry, we're not in 30 yet. So yes, there are some similarities, but there are also some differences. And again, we'll have, I think we'll have to look into it more closely and learn about it. So best survival in both years, Marquette, Cabernet d'Orsa, Chambers and Zweigelt. And I'm just telling you right now, remember Cabernet d'Orsa and remember Zweigelt, just for a short time, at least for this talk. We saw consistent poor survival on, on some of our really late ripening red varieties. Uh, since so, Mouvet, Canassiana, Cabernet Sauvignon, the Rift, Barbera. And then we, go, we saw good survival on some, but really poor on others, like Carmenera, Malvasia, Merlot. Yeah. Moving away from the variety test to cold hardiness on the rootstock. And yes, really big difference. So on the top, now you see the 2019 event for Viognier. At the bottom, you see the 2020. And where we're seeing a very large difference in the outcome, one thing that has actually stayed the same is that the own rooted vines were again are doing poorer than the grafted vines. And the three best performing stocks last year, again, the three best performing stocks, root stocks this year in terms of lack of cool injury. So two years in a row, low survival with own rooted vines. Um, the Cabernet Sauvignon trial, there's no point showing you any data from this year because everything was 100% dead. So, uh, you know, it's zero between all the rootstocks, so th there's no difference whatsoever. When we look at the cold hardy cultivars, you know, we're seeing a lot more damage on just about anything that's vinifera. And somewhat surprisingly, on the cold hardy ones, and I did not expect this at all, we are seeing actually less damage. Again, the ones that had damage last year are the ones that are showing up with the most damage this year. But even in our worst case, we are over 70%, there's a Cayuga here, we're over 70% live primary 
we have a very large number of live secondaries. So we are somewhere around 97, 98% fruitful, meaning that all of those cold hardy cultivars still have a full crop potential. So in general, the, the cold hardy ones were much less affected by the 2020 event. Um, but we are seeing a little bit of a similar pattern with the more higher damage on the cold hardy ones that are in the least cold hardy, cold hardy category, like Cayuga, Shambles, and Nore and Traminet. So why are we seeing so much more damage in 2020? You know, for one thing, in 19, the temperature was even lower. And the, and the simple answer to that is we had a pretty much a lack of a cold acclimation in 2020 because we had a very, very warm October. So let's compare those two years. Um, the killing frost in 19 was very early on the 11th of October. But before the really extreme cold event at the end of the month, we actually had an additional 11 freeze events. Okay. We had none in October 2020. Our first event was our killing frost. Okay, and it was also the one that was the really extreme event. The, the average temperature for October right up to, to, the, to the extreme event in 19 was a 49 Fahrenheit, which was the fourth quarter we have recorded here at the well, meeting, but... versus 60 on six uh, degrees, which is the second warmest that, that we've seen here at the station. So we're talking one of the coldest Octobers compared to one of the warmest Octobers. The minimum temperature was higher, uh, the event temperature was higher in, in 20, not as cold in, as it was in 19. Yes. But based on our uh, freezing tests that we do every week on Chardonnay, for example, we knew that Chardonnay, the LT50, the temperature to kill 50% of the buds, was below zero, whereas this year it was 11.3. So there's a 12 degrees difference between in, in cold hardness between the two years when the event happened. So this graph, uh, again, we have here some average maximum minimum temperature. This is just a, a running average for 20 years. And the solid line at the bottom shows you what the temperature of the buds, what, what the cold hardness of the buds would be. In this case, I'm looking at the LT50. So for Chardonnay, Chardonnay buds behave like the black line if we have an average year. Of course, there is no such thing as an average year. So this graph gets a little bit more busy now. Uh, this is again in red and, black and blue, the uh, hot and cold temperature maximum, daily maximum and minimum temperature. This is for this year. The black line you can see, all these asterisks are actually measured values going back to 2004, 2005 dormant season and extending all the way through 1819. So these are observations of Chardonnay. Um, the cloud sort of follows the same pattern as the modeled cold hardiness. It doesn't quite, and most times it doesn't quite get as low as the model suggests. So there may be some adjustment, but in general, there is a trend that says, yeah, okay, we're following this sort of pattern. Um, what you can see is that the cold event we have here from 2020 there's a lot of data points from previous years where the cold targets of Chardonnay, the LT50 of Chardonnay, was actually higher than the temperature we're seeing, saying any event like this, even in previous years, would have caused massive damage. What is also shown here, that's in the, in the red open circle, I can get my cursor back here, these circles here, that's last year. And what you're seeing is that every one of these four points here, in fact, the fifth point is almost there, is much lower than everything we ever measured in the previous 15 years, saying that last year Chardonnay was really quite cold hardy relative to the time point compared to any other data we have. These are the solid dots now are this year. And what you're seeing here is that they aren't cold hearted. In fact, these red solid dots are at the upper line, at the upper cloud of the um, asterisk. And in fact, we saw that on a number of different varieties, then from about mid or the second, first, second week in October, we're actually starting to see a loss in cold hardiness. 
which is all due to really, really high daily maximum temperature, and I think even more so pronounced, really warm night temperature. So that has resulted in a real lack, not just a lack of cold acclimation, but actually a loss in the cold hardiness that we already have. And we see it on Syrah, we see it on Jamison, we see it on Marquette, so it was pretty, pretty uniformly across all the varieties. Everyone was losing a little bit of cold hardiness in the, in the second, third week of October because of the really high temperature. Chardonnay is of the vinifera one that is actually one of the really early acclimating one. That's, you know, gains cold hardiness very quickly. And it's therefore more cold hardy than most vinifera in that October, November, early December period. So if we're seeing massive damage on Chardonnay, then there's no question we're going to see massive damage on some other varieties. So now I want to look at the survey data. So we went out, and I think it's 49, Marina said 51, who cares? It's 50, 50 sites, 38 cultivars. So actually with our site, it's 50, um, and there would be a lot more cultivars, but that's just looking at the industry data. And from industry, we looked at more than 50,000 parts so far. This gives you some idea. I think I'm missing a spot or two. I don't think I have 49 dots on there, but it gives you an idea where we sampled from near the research center, even slightly west of the research center, right into the vine dance where you can't actually go any further east unless you just want to climb up onto the Grand Mesa. So all the way to the very eastern part of the valley. This graph I'm going to leave sitting there for a little bit so you can digest it. So at the bottom axis here, we have the variety name. And each of the ponds is actually a site and it represents the percentage of live primary buds found at that site. Now, it's a little bit misleading, and I'm going to start with that um, because it's, then they have it all the way. So down here, you look, it looks like we have one site for Cabernet and one site for Cabernet, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. It's actually 11 and 13, but they all have the same number. And that number is a big fat zero, okay? which why there is the mean, so this, this bar here represents plus and minus standard error. In statistical terms, that indicates that about 66% of the data is, is in this range. And this line going across here is the average value, okay? So if you look at Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc, there is no error bar because 13 times zero is still zero. So you don't really have a measurement error. It just happens to be zero. So that there's no range. If you're looking at another variety over here, Marquette, you can almost see there is no range. You have very, very small, you know, we had basically three or four or five times a hundred. And then once we had a 95. So the average is 99 and the, and the, and the standard error is so small, you don't see it. Now low at the bottom end here, this represents, I believe 12 sites. And, you know, it's 11 times zero, and then some, I think we have a five in here. So what this graph shows is we have a number of varieties we don't have to worry about harvesting next year, which include Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Fro and Merlot. It includes Tempranillo. It probably includes Viognier. It most likely includes Malbec. Because even if you have seven or eight percent live primary buds, um, you know, we had a level that is so low, there wouldn't be any point netting the crop because the cost of netting would exceed the revenue of the crop. So these are pretty much gone. Let's move away from the bad news to the good news. Good news is, sorry, we go back up. The good news is we have a number of varieties that have had minimal or very, very small damage, which includes pretty much all the cold hardy ones. So we have at the top here, we have, we have Come on, pick my cursor back. From the left, we have Aromella. Most of them we found right around the 195% live primary. And then what the primary bud that was killed probably had a second but alive. Pretty similar with Shambleson, although we had an outlier that was, was low, that was below 60%. Marquette already mentioned we have 100% survival. Um, Terminate did on average really well with over 80% average. 
but we also have a number of vinifera in there, and that's where it becomes tricky. So when you look at Chardonnay, I think this is again from 10 sites, we have everything from no survival to all the way up to 78%. That's also true for Lemberger from 77 to zero. And Riesling, you go from 92 down to four. So we have a number of the Niffa varieties in here, Chardonnay, Lemberger, and Riesling, where we have either very high survival or very low survival. And so we can, we can determine the mean, but it doesn't mean anything. You really have to figure out for your own where we are. What I take from this is that those three varieties, there is a potential actually in some cases for a full crop, but for most of the other vanifera, there's no potential whatsoever. This next graph, so all these, the previous ones here all, we have at least uh, three or four sites. So we have, we have replication. At the bottom here, we only have one or two sites at the most because there are more vineyards out there growing those varieties. And again, when you look at the upper level, wherever we are close to 100% or 90%, if you look down, it's probably associated with a cultivar that's, that's considered a cold hardy one, be that Frontenac, be that Itasca, be that La Crescent, St. Vincent, Verona, they all high up. So on the cold hardy ones, it looks like we okay. We also have a number of varieties in here. Okay, one thing, make my cursor. Like Tiroldigo and Zweigelt that are actually also pretty high. So we have another couple of uh, and Rakatsatelli. So we have another three varieties that are vinifera that actually have done well. Remember, I told you to remember Zweigel and Cabernet d'Orsa? Well, here's another Zweigel. So we had in our cultivar trial, this is actually in a, in a commercial vineyard in Palisade. We're finding very similar high survival of Zweigel at that site. So that confirms what we're seeing in our cultivar trial. Would anyone like to uh, tell me what one of the parents for Zweigelt and also for Cabernet d'Orsa is. Does anyone have an idea? I give it five seconds, okay. One of the parents, the parent for both, Zweigelt and Cabernet d'Orsa is Lenberger. And which variety actually has had reasonable survival of the vinifera is Lenberger. Okay, so both Lemberger and its offspring actually did a really decent job coming through this event. And as far as Lemberger, as Cabernet, Adorza and Spiegel uh, is concerned, it, they also came out with flying colors in the 2019 event. So that's something I think that, that we as researchers can take back and say, okay, here's the genetics that obviously has some really early acclimating features, which could be of value to, to Colorado. And we have to look at other maybe other Lemberger crosses that are out there. And there are some out there. So, so I'm summarizing the survey. We pretty much have 100% crop loss with most vinifera cultivars here in the valley. And I would say in, in, in uh, Western Colorado, with the exception maybe of Montezuma County. And I, I might get back to that. Um, cold hardy interspecific cultivars have pretty much minor or no butt damage at all. And so we still have a full potential crop potential for those. And the crop, given, given what we know about how much of each we grow in the valley or in the state, our statewide crop loss is at least, or the crop loss in the Grand Valley is at least 70%. And I would say statewide, the crop loss is probably closer to 80%. So recapping what I already said, we have some vinifera that survived this event, Chardonnay, Lemberger, Riesling, Rocazzatelli, Tiroldigo, and Zweigelt. And I think with some pruning adjustment, we will be able to get a moderate crop provided, and that is currently the big unknown, provided that we don't see significant trunk and cordon damage. What about other sites? What about other regions in the state? So again, uh, like in 2019, you can see Canyon City and Penrose actually being slightly below zero, even in this year's event again. 
But we're also seeing delta at about negative one, Eckert negative two, Montrose negative four, Olesa almost negative five. So they all drop below zero. Very different is Cortez and Yellow Jacket. So it appears that the front that moved through on the 25th to the 28th really of, of uh, October didn't drop quite as far south and they were actually spared. So the, the whole front veered off to the east, got Canyon City and Penrose, but actually didn't, didn't go quite as far south of the Four Corners. And uh, so there might be significant bud survival even on our vanilla varieties. But we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't tested anything from down there. This is data here from uh, um, Rogers Mesa. And what you're seeing is for each variety, you see two columns. The first column was actually from samples that were taken on the 26th of October. So on the morning of the 26th of October, the minimum temperature at Rogers Mesa was 9.6. And Brian Brady, so big thanks to Brian, went out and he collected those 20 canes per variety and brought them inside. And it repeated this process on the 27th of October in the morning when the temperature, overnight temperature was 0.2. So between the first morning, first night, frost night, 9.6 to 0.2, we dropped another 9.4 degrees. And if you look at the first bar for each variety across the six or seven, whatever we have here that we, we monitored, you're finding pretty close to 100% bud survival. Okay, if you look at the second night, and if you look in particular here at Chamberson, for example, Chamberson had 100% bud survival on the morning of the 26th. It had zero primary bud survival, but 1% secondary. So it went from perfectly fine full crop after nine degrees to no crop whatsoever on the second night at zero Fahrenheit. NY81, which is a, is a Riesling cross, a cold hardy variety, 100% survival of, after the first night, nine degrees colder, we're looking at 17% primary buds. Vidal, 100% fruitful buds, some are secondaries, to barely none, barely any. On the positive side of things, Marquette, a small loss, MN1200, which is a sibling cross of, of Marquette. Yes, some damage but still 90 plus percent fruitful. And Aromella went from 100 to about a 72, 73. So those three varieties actually have very minimal or reasonable damage that we can actually still have a full crop potential. Whereas some of the less cold hardy, cold hardy varieties survived the first night, but didn't make it to zero. If that's the case with them, with the cold hardy ones, I don't see how any Chardonnay or Riesling in, in Delta County or Montrose County could not be 100% damaged. We don't have the data for that, but looking at, at the results from this uh, graph here, it would strongly suggest that we have no crop on vinifera in Delta or Montrose County. So Southwest corner may have escaped the damage because it didn't get quite as cold. Um, in other, all other parts, I expect to see a near 100% or 100% crop loss with the European grapes. Um, and, you know, as you saw from the Rogers one here, some of that will extend to even the cold hardy varieties. And remember, you know, um, Canyon City was below zero, Penrose was even colder, uh, Fort Collins went to, I think, minus seven or something like that. So again, front range location might have also significant damage to cold hardy varieties. Let me finish with one before we open up for question here. What do we do now? Okay, so first of all, we should do a detailed assessment of the bud damage in, in, in your vineyard. Um, even if you grow Cabernet Sauvignon, even if you grow Cabernet Franc, entertain yourself, go out, select some buds, cut them open. I think the number will be zero, but just confirm it for yourself. Uh, we know it, that they're dead. When we have Chardonnay and Riesling um, and Lemberger, and maybe someone else has Tiroligo, do an assessment what the damage is at your site, okay? Because those well, are the Scott, ones where, we, where we're seeing, where we're seeing um, survival. Oh, okay. Hey, can I leave it in the cooler until tomorrow? Can you please turn your microphone off, Scott? Okay, I'll, I'll, we'll be up for it tomorrow. <laughs> 
Okay, so minor, please turn your microphones off when you're talking. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, do, do an assessment of your own site. Um, I mean, you might just be confirming our results, um, but particular ones where we're seeing a range, we need, you need to know where you are. If you find that you actually have live primary buds, then we can start looking at what do we do and how do we adjust pruning uh, numbers. And this here comes from a, a publication out of Washington State. You can find it on Oregon Extension Bulletin or, or Michigan Extension Bulletin. They're all the same. They all follow the same formula. It says, if you have under 25% primary bud damage, there really is no need to adjust your pruning. Prune as you would always do. And part of that is because if you don't have more than 25%, there's also a very high likelihood that all the ones that are dead, the secondaries are alive. So your impact is actually quite small. Maybe you leave an extra bud or two, but you really don't need to. If the damage is in the range of 25 to 75% of the primary bud damage, then make an adjustment and use table three. And I'm gonna show you table three on the next, on the next slide. If you're over 75% primary bud damage, they say either hedge the vine and do a long pruning basically, leaving five or six buds per cane, or don't do anything at all and wait until bud break and then make your pruning decisions. So let's look at this um, intermediate range here, 25 to 75% primary bud damage. How do we adjust? You adjust by knowing what your crop potential is, okay? For that, what we do, we take the percentage of the live primary buds, and we look at the percentage of the live secondary buds, but we multiply the percentage of live secondary buds by, by 0.25. So in other words, only one quarter of that value. We add those two together and divide it by 100. And that gives us a, a function, a, a ratio, to adjust the number. So let's, let's jump at the bottom here because here's an example. Let's say that you have 30% live primaries and 60% live secondaries, okay? So your cropping potential, crop potential is one for the primaries, that gives you the highest crop, but it's much less for secondaries, which is why we're multiplying the secondary percentage by 0.25. So in this example, 60 times one quarter gives you 15. So you had 30 plus 15 divided by 100. So your cropping potential right now is only 45% of a crop. If you prove normal, that's what you would get. But we want to get to 100, right? So what we do then is say, okay, in this particular example is saying, in a normal year, you would be leaving 24 buds. If you did that, you had 45% of a crop. So you don't want to do that. So you take this function that you figured out here, you divide the 24 by 0.545, and it says, to get to 100% cropping potential, you'll need to leave, leave 53 buds. Okay, that's how you adjust your pruning based on that formula. Does anyone have question on this? Nope, then I'll move on. Otherwise, if you don't, if you don't have an order, you can put it in the, in, the, in the chat box and Miranda is actually, I think, uh, monitoring that. Okay, I suggest one modification to the above um, because as I say, you know, unlike, unlike wine, dead buds don't improve with age. I mean, although they come back to life, if they're dead, they're dead. So with Cabernet Sauvignon, with Cabernet Franc, we are not talking about a percentage of, of dead primary buds. We're talking about 100% bud kill. Why would anyone hatch their vines to a long cane that when every single bud along that cane is dead. That makes no sense. I mean, they're dead. They're not gonna come back from the, from the, from the, back from the dead. So there's really no point doing that. So what I suggest, and that's something that we already have, have started to do, we actually started to cut everything back, all of the canes, even longer spurs, hatch them down right to the cordon. And then, you know, cross our fingers that we don't have cordon and, and trunk damage. That's option one. Option two is you wait until spring 
And if there's no split trunks, you do option one, you cut everything right back to the corner. Why? Okay, the buds on the canes are dead, they're not gonna break. No point leaving them. Pruning back to the cordon, however, actually encourages the buds that are embedded in the old wood. There's lots of buds embedded in old wood that never broke. It encouraged them to break. So what I'm hoping for, what will happen in our really severely damaged varieties, cultivars, if we cut everything off, that we're gonna get shoots virtually out of the woodworks. Remember all those shoots you didn't know you had, you'd left there, they're coming out of the wood and even in a normal year, well, when you have total crop failure, total no butt break at all, there's even more pushing out of it. And we're gonna use those shoots when they come out next year to basically reestablish a productive grapevine. That's the idea. If the trunk is damaged, you see the trunks starting to split in spring, we have nothing left but cut them all back to the ground and start retraining from the bottom up. Now, hopefully, graft unions have been covered up and you know, we, we're working with something that comes from above the graft union. Any sucker that comes from below the graft union is a rootstock and has no value, no point training it up, unless in the future you plan to do a field grafting and grafting over, which would not be my suggestion. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank the Vine Board for funding our research here, also the CSU Experiment Station. I'd like to acknowledge the grant that the, what's now called the NE 1020 to the USDA, which is our cultivar trials. And I'd like to open it up for questions. If while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I was gonna see if I could share my screen. Let oh, me stop horse. sharing first. Okay. Yeah, you're good to go. Thank you. Horst and I were in the vineyard. Can you see this? It's the same Washington State University publication that Horst was just showing a lot of the pruning charts from, but Horst was telling me about his observations in terms of when you're testing for trunk damage or cane damage in your vineyard, we can send this publication out. Um, I'll put the link in the chat in just a moment here, but basically it involves scraping away the layers of bark to showcase the xylem and phloem. But these pictures from Washington State make the xylem and phloem look really bright green. But in conversations with Horst, he was saying that he has never seen that bright of a color in doing these samples, but he still finds live wood. So it's hard to portray how to go about this without being in person. Um, but don't automatically assume if you're seeing more of a white coloration that the wood, that the trunk or shoot is dead. What I was making note of when we were walking through some vines together is if the tissue is alive, it was a little bit moist and had a very slight green hue and we were considering that alive. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that horse, but I would just didn't want people maybe, to... Maybe, maybe show the trunk at the bottom because I think that's also very good to see. So when they're dead, it's pretty obvious because you actually will see brown, brown or brown streaking right into the wood, right into the... I mean, sometimes I can cut a trunk down and it goes right into the center. There's no question that that is dead. And, and as, as Miranda said, when you cut into this, and it's really dry, it's gone. You know, dry and brown is not a good combination. The sort of in between, the picture in the middle, um, yes, we're getting phloem damage, which is on the outer side, right below the bark. But as long as we don't get xylem browning really bad, I think those trunks are alive. And, and as, as Miranda said, we, we don't tend to see that really bright color. I mean, 
I would assume if I did the same thing in New Zealand, it would pale Washington state. You go into really wet climates with lots of rainfall, things stay a lot more lush all around, even the color of the wood. Uh, we don't see that. So a healthy wood forest tends to be a pale green. Um, and then in spring, when we get moisture back in, everything comes back, hopefully pops back and gets really, you know, much more green. It, it appears more green. But it has to do with the, with the dryness of our tissues as well. So really brown, it's gone. There's no question about it. Um, the in-between is much harder to see. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure we are aware of that. And now if you have questions, please feel free to ask away. At what time of year should you make that assessment? Should you do it right now in the winter time or wait till the spring? It, it depends what you want to do, Rex. I mean, I think if you, we have a lot of pruning to do and we have varieties that we know are gone, why wait? We, we, we're doing it now. So that's, that's why we do it now. If I cut something now and I'm unsure, I leave it, wait for spring. But I have Cabernet Sauvignon where we have 100% butt kill. Yeah. There's no point waiting. Yeah, in the sense. Riesling, okay, I got one end that's 5% damage, I have one end that's 55% damage. So there you might want to do one different than the other. Um, but 100% dead to me, it's like I don't want to wait. I got too many things to worry about in spring, particularly if you got split trunks. Um, let's take care of this now and the other ones we wait. Okay. Thank you. Horst, did you yes. see a difference uh, geographically? You know, you had some of those uh, varieties that had a range. Was there a, a pattern to that range? It, it wasn't, John. Um, so one thing I didn't, I, you know, I, I mentioned that the October 19 was an advection freeze. So was the October 20, in fact. In fact, it was 11 degrees from Palisade to Fuda. But there was no temperature difference if you look at the... Uh, weather stations, and we have a lot more sensors out, so we know there really wasn't. On the morning, sorry, at around 11 o'clock on the 20th, 11 in the evening on the 26th, depending where in the valley you were, there was a small inversion forming. So we had a very, very quick, very sharp dip. Uh, for example, at the Garfield site, we dropped to 7.8. Right after midnight, the wind picked up again and, and everything went back up to 11 degrees or whatever it was. But there was a very small window. Uh, we see it in some vineyards, we see, don't see it in others. But the, the level of damage we're seeing is, is incredibly uniform across the valley. I mean, again, I want to, you know, I think most of you are wondering about what to do. I think, as I said earlier, if, if you have a small vineyard, by all means, don't do anything. Just wait till spring. I mean, we might be wasting our time here going in and, and chopping things back to the cordon if in spring our trunks are split, which wouldn't surprise me. Okay. But again, I'm doing it because I don't, I, I have got too much work going on. But if you have a smaller vineyard where you know you can get everything done within a week, wait till butt break. Wait till, till you know, you can see what's going on or not and then respond to it. You know, John, in your case, I think, you know, some of the varieties where you know you're damaged, you know, take the, take the head trimmer. I mean, you know, you've got a pre pruner run it through. I mean, you know, you can even make, those, even you can make the spring because of the machinery you have. Most of us cannot. You know, I take, I take some, some comfort in sort of that we've been able to identify a number of varieties and, and maybe some offspring looking at some of the genetics that say, hey, even with this potentially more frequent, you know, extreme fall events, there's some things out there that can handle this. You know, and, and I think Zweigel and Dorsa make nice red wines, no question. You know, they're not covered in Sauvignon. No? Uh, they are alive, Cabernet Sauvignon is not. So to me, that makes a difference.
So, um, Horace, this is uh, Brian Wagner from Endless Endeavor Winery in Peonia. And um, I'm just wondering if there's a general correlation at all of the LT50s for um, hybrids compared to things like Chardonnay and, uh, and the vinifera. Like it's 10 degrees, is it a 10 degree spread typically? And one thing I, um, grapes is that they're, they're very early ripening and so they were hardening, they were pretty, the, the, the wood had hardened up by the end of October. So I'm hoping that is a good sign. Yeah, um, you, you're, you're addressing a number of different questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go step through it. So the wood hardening was happening on everything. That's one thing. So they all turn, you know, take the wood color, turn brown, etc. That, that that happened to everything. What didn't happen is that we had a mild freezing, killing frost, leaves fall off. And then the sap, all that moisture that's in the in the canes and the trunks dissipates because there's nothing pulling it back up. That didn't happen. For you, it happened because I think you had a little frost right before the event in the Grand Valley. We went from totally green to totally fried with you know sap in the trunk. That's a different story. What we did find, you know, coming back to the question between Chardonnay and, and for example, the cold hardy ones, Marquette, we found Marquette to be equally not cold hardy. Than Chardonnay. And we've seen it before as well. We saw it last year, not last year, in other years they've been staying warm. They actually did not harden off. Our least cold hardy variety before the event was La Crescent. Its LT50 was 19 Fahrenheit, measured six days, five days before the event. But where the difference comes from, that the moment it got cold, those cold hardy cultivars acclimated extremely fast. We saw like almost a 20 degree drop within a week, gain in cold hardiness before and after the event. And the vinifera made it 10, and that wasn't enough. So that's the really big difference, the speed at which they can acclimate. Uh, as far as the range goes, yeah, normally within a 10 degrees, you go from nothing is dead and everything is dead. Some of the cold hardy ones, uh, Vidal, St. Vincent, Marquette not so much, uh, La Crescent sometimes, we find more of a spread. Uh, we're finding LT10s that are visibly high, but then the LT90, when 90% is really, really low. So you have maybe a 15 or 20 degree range. You get a little bit of damage at a relatively not so cold temperature, but then you need to go to negative 25 to really kill them. But yeah, and then the LT50 is really low. It's just like we're getting a few butts damaged. LT10s tend to be quite high sometimes, but the, the 90s are really, really low. So that's sort of three answers, I guess, hopefully. Hopefully I addressed everything you asked. You're muted right now. You're, you're on mute. All right, we probably have time for one more question if anyone's got one. But if not, we can probably decide to wrap things up. I don't know if Doug or Cassidy had any closing comments for us, but thank you so much, Horst. That was so very informative. And as we can tell by the number of people that logged in today, I know it's extremely important to our industry. So thank you. On a personal note, I would just add, uh, you know, some of my favorite wines uh, in the world, outside of Colorado, of course, come from Austria. And there's a lot of very interesting blends with Zweigelt. Uh, Zweigelt Merlot, Zweigelt Cabernet. Um, and so maybe there really is a, um, a, a potential for that kind of um, winemaking here in Colorado, if, if Zweigelt is one of our um, leading contenders for fighting this. So I would encourage you, if you can, to try to find some of those Zweigel blends from Austria. Uh, may not be easy, but uh, worth worth seeking out. Um, on, on, the, on the good news, Doug, there is a number of Lemberger crosses that have been made in, in Czech Republic with Cabernet Franc. 
in Germany with uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and other varieties, where you know the Lemberg genetics is in there, uh, in, the, in a number of different different cultivars, but they're not in this country, for example, right now. It would be really interesting to get some of those, you know, imported. And I've talked to FBS about it, but it's not <laughs> not as straightforward. Um, and many of them are protected, but you know, certainly the Lemberger genetics and, and obviously Um yeah. It's interesting to look at cultivars that have that background, that's for sure. So well, that's great news. Uh, and I just had a couple of quick announcements, Doug, if you have anything else before we... I was just going to ask if anybody has any requests or suggestions for topics or speakers. Um, you know, we're going to try to get back on at least once a month uh, for these calls. So um, probably waiting until January, but um, please uh, send them to Cassidy or myself or Kyle. Um, or Miranda or Horst, because we'd love to, uh, you know, uh, target topics that are useful and, and of value to all of you guys. Absolutely. Um, before we head out, I just wanted to remind everybody that our VINCO registration is live. The conference is virtual this year due to COVID um, and will take place January 18th through the 22nd. Um, the registration is Fairly reasonable, we think. Uh, we have a full day uh, tasting room works workshop with Donnie Winchell for $10 for CAVE members. And then the rest of the week from the 19th through the 22nd is just $50. And you can pop into any or all of the seminars. After you register, you'll be able to, um, uh, all of the recordings will be available to you. So we know that folks are still busy, um, even through COVID and maybe you won't be able to take part in all of those sessions. So those will be available to you for one month following the sessions. Um, also regarding uh, VINCO, our awards of excellence nomination forms are out there for our membership. It's all on the same page on our website at winecolorado.org. So we're currently opening the nominations for winery of the year, grower of the year and friend of the Colorado wine industry. This year, a little different in everything we've all gone through together, uh, for sure, through 2020. So if there's some folks that come to mind, please head over there and make your nominations and send them in. The deadline is January 8th. And then last but not least, our board election is moving forward. Uh, the deadline for uh, those votes to come in is this Friday at 5 p.m. So if you've not cast your vote for our three open positions, please do so. And all of that's on our website as well. And then lastly, I just want to wish everybody a happy holidays and a happy new year. If I don't see you guys or chat with you between now and Christmas and uh, the end of 2020, which I think everybody's looking forward to. That's a, that's a big holiday right there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So with that, have a good one. And thanks for joining us, guys. Thank you all. We'll get this recording posted uh, on coloradowine.com uh, as soon as we can. So thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Thanks, Horst. Hey, Horst. Bye.